thanks everyone for coming. Um, the title, uh, the, the title that was, that was given in your schedule was a little bit different. Uh, I changed plans mainly because uh, uh, there's an annual lecture given to the Geological Society of Australia, the AK Denby lecture, and it was actually given uh, on the 29th of March um, in the in the city while Cyclone Debbie or post Cyclone Debbie was bearing down on us. Um, and, and the theme of that lecture I gave was on the Mining Queensland project, which is of course part of the part of the BRC, part of this this uh, this group. And uh, talking to uh, Travis and Mark and company, uh, I understand that there really hasn't been an opportunity to present some of the work involved in the, uh, in the Mining Queensland project. So I thought this would be a good opportunity. But uh, I'll several times uh, make it very clear that I'm I'm by no means taking credit for this work, having only been here for two months. But uh, well, I think it's a very exciting project, and it's something that uh, that we should be doing uh, doing more of. And I'll try and uh, demonstrate to you why I think it's a it's it's an important style of project that's going to be more and more important as we try to explore in, in deeper and deeper areas. Uh, and uh, it's it's worth it to point out that this project received major sponsorship from the Geological Survey of Queensland. Uh, also, uh, major provision of data from Genova Resources and, and additional software um, and processing support from data mine and ISIS, full year geophysics. And this, uh, this project, the Deep Mining Queensland project, is really uh, what I would like to think of as one of the pre competitive data sets of the future. All of the ore bodies, or almost all the ore bodies that you're working on, at whatever stage of them, whatever, whatever part of the mining and processing. Uh, stream you're dealing with um, will likely have been found with the aid of pre-competitive data sets, data sets that are available, uh, that, that are made available by government surveys, that are in uh, public domain information that people have used to guide their, their exploration and development. And when we look at pre-competitive data, therefore, it's really a key driver of exploration investment. And in exposed areas, which is where, where most of the world's ore bodies have been found. Those sorts of data sets comprise geological mapping, open file geophysics, geochemistry, uh, mineral occurrence data, and, and Australia is very well served in those. In fact, it's probably second to none in the world on that front. Uh, when you look at covered and deep areas, um, it's much more difficult to carry out exploration of these things. So we need basement geological interpretations, three-dimensional geological models. Uh, to a somewhat lesser extent, we need open file geochemistry. We certainly need open file geophysical data. And, and there are very few areas in Australia and even less around the world where this sort of data is available to drive exploration under cover. And so we really need to develop a new toolkit to aid deep and covered exploration. And I think the DMQ program is part of that. So this, the lecture I gave was, was the AK Denmead lecture. So I put up a slide showing Al Knox Denmead in the corner. He was the district geologist in Charters Towers from 1946 to 1950. And these are some of the some of the data sets that are available, that are now available. If you wanted to carry out exploration in, in the Charters Towers region, you could you could sit in front of your computer in your underwear and, and download all that, download all that information within minutes and actually guide uh, and, and plan a, uh, an exploration program. In the Mount Isa region, where the Deep Mining Queensland project is focused, down in this area here, this red line here represents the outcrop limit of the, of the Mount Isa region. And all these dots here are occurrences of various different types. Mount Isa is one of the special places on the planet when it comes to mineralization. Until you get to the edge of the outcrop, you can see from the magnetics, this is magnetic uh, data in the background, government open file data, that all of the rock sequences that host mineralization in Mount Isa continue for hundreds of kilometers, that's 100 kilometers there, um, to the north and south and to the west and east under cover. And there's been virtually no discoveries made in that area, very few. Another, another thing to look at in terms of the current context of exploration is who's doing exploration these days. Exploration more and more, this, it, from 1975 to 2013 or so, these, these different lines represent major and, and moderate companies, the darker blues. The green represents junior companies. Junior companies are taking over exploration to a large extent from, from major companies. And who's spending the money? Junior companies are now spending more than 50% of the money uh, on, on exploration. 
And uh, whether they're doing it well is another question, but uh, they're doing that. And when you look at discoveries, and again, this is basically from 1950 till up, up, almost up till now, with gold in, in yellow, base metals in green, what we're seeing is a progressive deepening of, of discoveries as, as we have to go deeper and uh, spend more money, um, put more effort into trying to find deeper, deeper ore bodies. And the methods are changing as well. So these different colors represent um, depth. So we're going we're going down in depth here and looking at different methods from you know geophysics <laughs> to just looking at things exposed on the surface. And as we get down to deeper levels, what we're seeing is that is that uh, conceptual targets, um, and extrapolation, known mineralization, and just drilling are very important. And again, when you focus in on the area that the Deep Mining Queensland project is focusing on, what we're looking at here is the edge of the Nile layer. The green line represents 100 meters cover, and the red line here represents 500 meters cover. So there are extensive areas that, that are within range of exploration. Um, and uh, in Queensland, and this is a graph of exploration expenditure in Queensland from 1989 to 2015, what we're seeing is that as the challenges of exploration undercover and some other land access challenges and general lo lo loss of, of support for exploration in, in, uh, in the investment community has taken hold, there's been a decrease in exploration. But when you, when you think about an investment decision in Northwest Queensland, the pros are that it has second to none endowment. It's a first world jurisdiction, so uh, very safe. Um, secure assets, and as I said, a very strong open file pre-competitive data. The cons are, the targets are likely to be covered, very high risk, there's a big cost to development of geological targets, and, and some, some land access challenges as well. So really, um, coming around to thinking about a project like the Deep Mining Queensland project, what can encourage a junior company, or, and keeping in mind that juniors are spending over 50% of the money on exploration to, to carry out exploration undercover in, uh, in Northwest Queensland. And there are things like value-added geological understanding, like depth to basement, 3D geology undercover, um, and, and mapping and identification of key target criteria. Those data sets that will promote um, that will promote that information to, to investors and, and financial assistance for, for bona fide risk taking exploration. In fact, there was just an announcement yesterday that the, the state government has provided, I think it's, uh, I can't remember the exact figure, but a su substantial amount of money to, uh, to, to match um, risk taking drill programs in the Northwest Queensland region. So, really, the case for 3D exploration is that deeper and covered <coughs> exploration is reality and it's going to be harder riskier and more expensive. It's going to be reliant on geophysics and, and stronger geological understanding and the traditional pre-competitive data sets that we use are not going to be as important. And so geological understanding derived from intelligent interpretation of geophysical data sets and extrapolation from known from nearby exposed areas is also going to be critical. And that really brings us to the Deep Mining Queensland project. It's a, it's a project that's centered on a well-endowed part of the Mount Isa region from Ernest Henry, uh, from just south of Ernest Henry down through Swan, Mount Elliot, to Osborne, and further south under Tunnel. It's, it's an area that has multiple copper gold occurrences, lots of indications of mineralization, lots of places where we can, that we can use as training data sets to go away and, and do broader targeting. Um, and one large mass mineable resource. And so um, it's, a, it's an ideal sort of laboratory to, uh, to, to, to develop the methodologies that we're trying to develop to, to, to target in this sort of environment. So the project, in, in a broad summary, has, has involved gaining a deep understanding of the, uh, of, the, of the geology of that region in the third dimension, mapping that, and combining that with insights into, into the economic uh, viability of deposits depending on their, their characteristics, mining methods, and so on. Um, the DMQ project team, and I won't go through them all because they're probably, these are probably names that are all familiar to you. As I said, I've only really become involved in the last uh, two months, and, and my focus really has been more on, on, on delivery, turning, making sure that it gets turned into a tool 
um, that will be used by as many uh, by as many companies as possible who are exploring that region, and that perhaps will be a model to, for development of similar approaches elsewhere. So, in terms of the summary of activities for that project. Um, the first thing that was carried out was a synthesis and interpretation of government data sets and, and much more detailed geophysical data sets provided by Chernobyl. And that resulted in an updated solid geology interpretation and a four-dimensional tectonostratigraphic interpretation of the, of the solid geology. So that involved a very detailed, a lot, a, a lot of uh, 3D um, exercises, interpretation exercises that are carried out in different areas are 3D exercises rather than geology exercises. They'll, they, 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 they make the geology very schematic um, in, in comparison to the level of detail that's provided on geological maps. This project, on the other hand, has really focused on a, a high level of geological detail and a lot of work has gone into, into accurate uh, mapping of, of the third dimension. Um, it also required us to use um, a combination of geological interpretation and geophysics to do an updated model of granite geometries in the region because the, the granite geometries are, are very important for mineralization. Um, as well, there's quite an abundant uh, geochemical data set and that was, that was analyzed as part of the project and consideration of grade and depth constraints for underground mass mining. And uh, in, in light of all of that information, um, the the, uh, one of the key outputs was a set of key process criteria for identification of, of other targets for potentially mass mineable deposits. And propagation of those criteria uh, to search for new targets in the regional model. So I'll start by just looking briefly at, at some of the data sets that are available and what I, what I have done in comparison to the, you, you might be happy to know, um, in, the, in comparison to the, the actual AK Denby lecture is that I've removed some of the, some of the really um, lurid um, or, or granular geological detail that, that, uh, that might not be of interest to the majority of this audience and, and focused more on, on some of the outcomes. But it is worth pointing out uh, the difference between uh, this is the this is the publicly available data, for example, from from Swan Mount Elliot up here down to the Stara copper gold deposits, and this is the high resolution data that we were able to work with, resulting in a much more detailed uh, geological interpretation and structural interpretation through this region, allowing a more detailed understanding of the controls and mineralization, and and that that data set plus uh, plus. Uh, an updating of, of, uh, of the understanding of the, of, the, of the deformation and stratigraphic development of the region um, allowed updating of, of the time space chart. And all these little blocks are rock sequences, so time is on this axis, and we're looking at, looking at a period from about 1.77 billion years ago to 1.4 billion years ago. Each one of these blocks represents a, a, a uh, a rock sequence in a different uh, in a different geographical area, and all these diagrams here. And I won't, you know, obviously you don't need to know the detail of them. Represent different deformation episodes um, over printing those those uh, or uh, affecting those rock sequences. And on the right here, what I'm showing is the updated solid geology interpretation for that area, um, including some areas that are exposed, um, and then some areas further in the south that are that are not exposed. And obviously, there's a much more detailed interpretation uh, that, or a much more detailed presentation given by Mark a year or so ago uh, that's available on, on the BRC website. So here's that same solid geology interpretation in an oblique view, and half of the 47 sections that were built on the basis of that, uh, of that solid geology and, and, and interpretation. That's 40 kilometers, that scale bar is 40 kilometers. Each one of these sections is eight kilometers apart. So, so we're, we're about 200 kilometers from, from one end of this to the other, and, and it's about 100 kilometers across, just to give you a feel for what the size of the area was. Um, and those, those sectional interpretations were built into strings in the third dimension, and there's, uh, again, we're looking at the solid geology interpretation now with 3D surfaces derived from those areas. So, in, the, in this lighter gray, we're, we're showing major faults. And the different colors here show some of the key stratigraphic surfaces. 
and one that you'll hear me mention later is this darker blue one here, the, the top of the, of the Stavely, uh, Stavely formation, which is, a, which is a key interface between uh, oxidized uh, and, and more brittle rock types that allow the transport of oxidized uh, saline, metal-bearing fluids, and, and the more reduced carbon-bearing sequences that sit above them that often seem to act as a sink for mineralization, as, a, as the site where mineralization forms. Now, what you can also see in here is that there are areas where there are no surfaces whatsoever, and those are large areas of granite, um, and I want to talk a little bit about those now. So, um, this simplified diagram here shows the, the outcrop pattern of granite in the area. So it's an area where there have been a lot of intrusives, uh, large areas of, of, of granite, most of which intruded about 1.5 billion years ago. And on the right here, what we're looking at is an apparent density model on the basis of the gravity. Um, so most of you should know that, or may know, that, that granite is less dense than, than the surrounding metamorphic rocks. So it will appear as gravity lows. These, these darker blue and purple areas are gravity lows that are likely related to the presence of granite in the subsurface in those areas. And what we're also showing in this diagram is, is, the, is the distribution of, of outcropping granite. And you can almost see right away that there are areas where, where the, the, the geophysics for the gravity is saying that there must be granite, even though it hasn't been, uh, hasn't been mapped. And, uh, just to emphasize that a little bit further, so here's a, a map uh, of the showing the surface and subsurface distribution of granite with mineral occurrences. And what we can see in a number of different areas, you know, along, along here, along here, a number of different areas, the, the, the mineral deposits and occurrences actually cluster around the edges of the granites. Um, and when you look when you actually look at outcrop patterns, you may not be able to see them. There, there are a couple of little red blips in there. Those are mapped granites. And again, it shows very clearly that the granite signatures are much more extensive than, than the outcrops. So this is telling us two things. One, that the granite distribution is very important for prediction of mineralization. And two, that the geological map that we have is inadequate to tell us what the granite distribution is. So we need to do something else to, to work that out. And, and that's something else that we did was really a combination of geological interpretation and geologically constrained inversion. Now, some of you may not know what inversion is, but basically, um, when you when you have a gravity map, you can you can and 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 you know what the densities are of the rocks below your feet. You can actually run a program that will optimize a distribution of densities in the subsurface to recreate the measured gravity field. And uh, it's something that's done, done very often by geophysicists in order to come up with an interpretation of the subsurface geometry of rock types. And uh, this, is, this is one of, one of my favorite studies that was done in 1999 by Fabio Rochetti and, and company at CSIRO, where they actually they, they, they did some very simple models of, of, uh, so these are actually modeled numbers, they're not actual readings. What they did was take different geometries of more dense and less dense material and then do a, a fake gravity survey over top of them to get, a, to get a gravity signature. So here you've got more dense material, so you get a, a gravity high here, gravity low here. Here you've got sort of a mountain and a valley uh, on the boundary between the, the more dense and less dense material, and that mountain and valley is is recreated in the in the gravity data. Here you've got a single more dense material. It might be a it might be a gap row intrusion or something like that because they're very dense, or a sulfide ore body for that matter, because they're more dense than the surrounding rocks. And you get a and you get a single gravity anomaly associated with that uh, with that block. Now, um, what of, what you often have though when you're carrying out geophysical surveys in a in in a virgin area is you only have the gravity data, you don't actually know what the, what the geometry is, and that's why people carry out, uh, carry out inversion. But the problem with inversion is that you can make almost any geometry, um, you, you, can, you, you can make almost any geometry um, fit with the data, um, and, and, and if you have no geological information, it's unlikely that you're going to get a geologically reasonable result from that, uh, 
from that, uh, um, from that exercise. So in other words, you have to place a geological constraint. You have, to, you have to apply geological rules to that inversion in order to get a reasonable result. Um, but just to demonstrate a point, they decided to, to apply a different rule um, to, to their inversion um, exercise. They said the only constraint was the, uh, the, the resulting distribution of densities had to look like a picture of Mickey Mouse. <laughs> and they were able to do it quite easily. So each one of these, so the different colors from white to black represent different, different densities, each of which can produce these model outputs and, and um, still have a picture of Mickey Mouse. So what that tells you, it doesn't tell you that gravity is hopeless, even though it might lead you to that conclusion to start with, is that gravity inversion alone isn't going to produce a reasonable geological model. But if you have a, a geological model in mind, it can be made consistent with the gravity. You can refine that geological model by, uh, by, by constrained inversion uh, with the gravity. And that's really what's been done in this, uh, in this uh, pro program. Uh, so we have a, a, a denser basement and denser protozoic sequence and started with a, a very thin layer of, of less dense granite in here and then made that, made that the, the geometry of that granite uh, change in order to fit the in order to fit the gravity signature as well as fitting some predetermined boundaries based on qualitative interpretation of the of the uh, of the gravity and obviously to fit with the outcrop pattern of the gravity as well <coughs> or the outcrop pattern of the granites as well and the result of that in, the result of that inversion was a much different, much different granite model than the uh, than, than the outcrop pattern suggested. So these are the outcropping patterns, and, and these are a whole series of silicate granites. Keeping in mind that at this sort of crustal level, that's the general form that most granite in, intrusions take. Uh, they might look like blobs uh, when you look on a map, but they're actually silicate bodies. They have much greater horizontal extent than than a vertical extent. And um, just to uh, just to emphasize that point, the previous models for this area, and here's one from, a, from a, 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 another exercise that was done, um, but, there, but basically all of them have done the same thing, just extended the granites vertically into the, into the subsurface, even though that clearly wouldn't, um, wouldn't produce the, uh, the, the density or the gravity pattern that you see in, in the area. And again, the reason that's important, and here's just a, 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 a sort of section pulled out of the, out of the model showing the, some of the model uh, granite geometries based on, that, uh, based on that geometric inversion. And the significance for mineralization in this area is that we, we tend to have some of these flat roof areas where we see contact metamorphism and also metasomatism, which is just alteration, you know, retches and that sort of thing. Um, but th there's not a strong association with mineralization in those sorts of areas. But these sorts of steeper areas, like this one here, this one, this one, tend to be areas that, that um, where, the, where the, the heat in the granite and where the structures associated with the, the roof lifting that has to take place in order to get this granite in here produce heterogeneities that, that drive fluid flow um, and, and, and convection and produce the empirical association we see with mineralization. And here's just, a, you know, again, half of the sections um, where, where you can see the, the, the granite geometry in those, in those serial sections. The other part of this puzzle, I'm just going to take a diversion to it for a second, is some work that Travis spoke about in August last year, which is thinking about the economics of, of mineralization within this context. Um, and, and, that's, uh, and, and they came up with a, a tool that can be generally applied called PEAT Underground, Prospect Economic Evaluation Tool. Um, and, and really, its purpose is to, is to allow explorers, explorers are notoriously optimistic and, and pretty woolly-headed when it comes to economics. So it's to allow explorers to understand what they actually need to, to achieve in terms of a result before they, uh, uh, you know, before they spend a huge amount of money on, on what could ultimately turn out to be a, a hopeless case. Um, and, and it also provides a tool that allows you to, to rank your targets. 
So if you've got a, for for example, um, is it better to have a is it better to have a five meter intercept at, at five percent copper at, at 250 meters, or is it better to have a 400 meter intercept at at one percent copper at, at 1.5 kilometer step? Um, and uh, and th this tool allows you to compare those two things, even though they're obviously very different intercepts. And it's also a tool for ranking and, and, and deciding on whether, whether to continue, how to, how to um, um, I guess, plan your exploration investment, because that's a constant problem for exploration, is, is uh, you always have more projects than you have money, um, and, and optimizing that expenditure is a very important process, and not very well applied to this day. So, um, what, what was basically looked at, and again, there's a much more detailed presentation available on the BRC website looking at this, and, and there's a spreadsheet to play with if anybody is inclined to do it. But it's basically looking at a series of different scenarios from mass mining, block cave and sublevel cave scenarios, all the way to small sublevel open stopes at the other end. And as an example, you might look at Ernest Henry, that's a, that's a sublevel cave scenario here in the underground part, as I understand it, all the way down to Eloise, which is a much smaller copper gold deposit in uh, southeast of Cloncurry, which is, which is uh, at, way at the other end of a much smaller and, and, and more expensive uh, uh, mining approach. And I'll come back to what that tells you in terms of depth later. But when you actually look at all those different methods, from the large mass mining um, approaches to, to much, much more narrower approaches up in here, and you look at and you compare depth, which is on this axis, to grade over here. What you can, what you can um, establish, keeping other things equal, is a set of break-even curves. So for a block caving scenario, the, the break-even curve is pretty steep. Um, you can go a long way down with a block caving scenario, and 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 uh, um, people who've expressed, you know, when, when you. When people look at that first, they, they often say, how can that possibly be? Because uh, um, you know, if you're a kilometer and a half, presumably the challenges must be much greater before you can, uh, before you can actually get something like, like that going. But the reality is the, the amount of development required for this sort of scenario, number one, and number two, the scale of the operation in relation to the scale of the capital outlay to get down to that level is such that the, the curve is much steeper for that break-even line, whereas once you get up to to the the, uh, the much more selective mining methods, you can see that that curve starts to that the, the grade required to uh, to to justify an operation becomes much higher. So here's Eloise here, which is a, a high grade but relatively narrow deposit, and uh, basically if you buried Eloise another couple of hundred meters, it's questionable whether it would be economic or not. Whereas in Ernest Henry you could probably get it down to a kilometer or so, potentially, and still, uh, and still make it go over. So that tool is also, uh, has also been developed, and we're in the process of propagating that into the, into the model. Um, now, the style of mineralization, this is probably the, 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 uh, the only other nasty bit of, of uh, geological arm waving that you're going to see in this. The style of mineralization that we're dealing with here is IOCG, iron oxide copper gold mineralization. And, and basically, from the point of view of a process, it, there are, there are uh, a, a small number of major kind of process components that are necessary for this style of mineralization. Temporally, it correlates with this suite of intrusives called the Williams Suite about 1.5 billion years ago, and the majority of the granites in our model are that Williams Suite. And it's associated with um, what's called the D3, D4, um, late, the late east-west shortening event that you see in all, all around Mount Isa uh, in the uh, over printing and, and partly coinciding with that 1.5 million year um, William Suite. And something that is less obvious but is really required as part of the model is a source for um, a mixture of, of non-magmatic, possibly some magmatic, but, but, uh, but largely non-magmatic oxidized brines that are carrying that are that are circulating through the sequence stripping copper and gold and depositing in these in these uh, uh, in in the structurally controlled reduced deposition sites so that's that's the general model you're you're sucking 
bitter and grinds down into the sequence, stripping copper and gold when they hit reduced structurally permeable sites driven by, by convection related to the present presence of these granites, you're uh, localizing mineralization. So the key controls on mineralization that we're seeing are number one, stratigraphy. Uh, you, what we're showing here is the sequence, a sequence from this calc silicate sequence here to the to the more um, reduced Curidala formation. The names don't matter to you guys. And, that the, and all these dots represent um, major ore bodies. Almost all the major ore bodies in the area lie within this stratigraphic package. And associated with late faults. So you can see a number of late faults in here cutting into that package, which is the same color as here. And the, the granite margins, which are driving fluid circulation. And an example of that is, is uh, the Osborne region where you're seeing all of those ingredients. You've got, a, you've got a lake fault, you're sitting at the boundary between this calc silicate package which is oxidized with a more reduced Curidala formation along a, a, along a relatively lake fault, sitting under a granite that's recognized in the gravity. And uh, a variant on that, the star of Mount Elliot, or is the star region where, where we're seeing a structural juxtaposition of the same style of, uh, I guess, rocks with the same chemical characteristics and rheological characteristics, focusing, focusing mineralization with the other ingredients being the same. So I'm going to just look at those in a little bit more detail in the context of the, uh, in the, context of the uh, uh, model that we developed. So first, let's look at the granite margins. There's the bottle of granite. Uh, as, as it's been defined in the constrained inversion program that we have. And, and as I pointed out already, the key parts of that granite from the point of view of mineralization, empirically, are, and, and conceptually really, are the areas where the granite margins are steep. Those steep contacts are areas of, number one, strain heterogeneity, but number two, um, uh, areas that are more likely to to drive the sort of fluid convection that we need in order to focus mineralizing fluids. And, uh, and so what we've done here is, is highlight those areas where the, where the granite margins are steeper. And then built a target buffer with a, with, a vertical, um, with, a, with a vertical preferred orientation associated with it in order to, in order to extend, the, in order to match really the model where, where we're seeing circulation associated with that granite margin then being driven upwards uh, along the uh, along the lithostatic pressure gradient that we are likely to be seeing at these crustal, crustal levels. And as I said, another key control on mineralization is the stratigraphy. So we've got the stably calc silicate um, uh, formation, which is an oxidized and brittle calc silicate sequence, which is which is in equilibrium with the oxidized saline brine that's likely to be carrying the, uh, the, uh, the, the metals that form these deposits. And they precipitate when they interact with reduced uh, carbon or, or to a lesser extent magnetite bearing host rocks like we see in this Curidala formation. So if we look at mapping of that in the, in, within the model, what we're seeing here is uh, the stably formation in the subsurface. Here's the outcrop distribution of that stably formation. And, and what we've done is to build a buffer, whoops, to build a buffer around that portion of the stratigraphic interval part down, down into the stably for a certain distance, but, but covering a larger portion of the Curidala formation. And that buffer is shown in, in, in yellow here. And then the other key control is, is the, the late faults that you see associated with mineralization. So, uh, um, and when you look at the, the faults by age, what, what I'm showing here is, is the various regional faults that, we're, that we've mapped as part of the, part of the exercise. So, so in the blue here are, are some, of the, some of the earlier faults that are associated with north-south direct thrusting. Then these, these brown faults here are, are the main D2 um, that's the second deformation phase, which are associated with east-west shortening. Then we have a series of faults that are associated with later, def later deformation. This Pulkari fault running through here actually postdates uh, mineralization. These faults are, are, are cut by that fault. So there's a there's a, 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 a large, um, uh, I guess, exercise of, of mapping the, the more significant faults. 
from, from one end to the other. And what we're showing here is a buffer associated with those faults. And the reason that we define a buffer associated with these faults is that what we see um, here, but, but more generally in hydrothermal ore deposits, is that, uh, that, are, that, are, that, are, that are, I guess, related to, um, to deformation, is that the, the large mineralized ore bodies are often not hosted in the major faults. They're hosted in and around the major faults, in faults with small displacement that are forming in response. So the large faults are, are, are accomplishing regional strain, and the small faults around them are, are activating in response to those regional strain events and focusing fluid flow. Um, and it's a classic thing that you see even in, in, uh, in earthquake regions where, where the smaller faults are, are, are the focus of aftershocks where a lot of the fluid flow is happening as opposed to the, as opposed to the major faults that are, that are accommodating regional strain. So in order to reflect that, what we've done is built a buffer around these faults. So um, that, that green buffer is shown here. And if we add in the, the yellow of the, of, of, the, uh, of the stately buffer and the green of those buffers, you can see that there are areas where they coincide. And you can also add in that the, uh, the, the granite buffer, but it starts to become a little bit confusing when you, when you, when you add all those together. So what probably makes a lot more sense to do, and, and that there are a number of different things you can do with that, um, is, to, is to carry out intersections. So what we're looking at here is the areas where, where the structural buffer, the buffer around major structures, lies within the, the stratigraphic buffer that we've defined uh, covering the Staley formation and the, and the Curridala formation. So, so these are, are, if you like, fairways that, that lie within the uh, that, that that lie within the right stratigraphic interval and have major faults. And then what I've done here is just color those according to proximity to steep granite edges. So the, the hot colors here represent areas where where the um, where the mineralization uh, or where the where, where these structures the, the structures that are lying within the right stratigraphic interval also have underlying granite edges and are therefore with the process model we define um, uh, quite perspective. So uh, again, just another, another look at that. So we're we're really mapping three different things: proximity to that stable contact within uh, a, a buffer around the the, the correct age structures. And, uh, and, and as close as possible to these to, the likely fluid circulation systems associated with these steep granite edges. And if we add in some of, the, some of the deposits that we can see in the region, they do tend to occur uh, in association uh, with the, having developed the criteria uh, on the basis of those deposits, not surprisingly, they occur in association with, with, uh, with uh, with, with areas that you would identify as being uh, perspective in, in the model. But what it also highlights is a whole series of other areas that, that match all those criteria that are in the subsurface that have not yet been explored. So uh, um, you know, that's obviously uh, uh, an important observation that could guide future exploration. But to, to then move on to a sobering note, if we go back to the use of the, the uh, the prospect economic evaluation tool underground and, and be charitable and give ourselves two kilometers. Um, this this uh, plane here is basically um, the search space for an Ernest Henry type deposit. So so all, all these there's a whole area of prospective targets out in here that are unlikely to be economic. So if you if you looked at these and applied that tool, you'd say yes, they look like they're fantastic, but but it's unlikely that we're actually going to be able to make money out of them. Uh, even if we even if we encounter the sort of thing that we have. so again using this tool allows you to, to focus your uh, your area selection um, and if you apply the LOE search space um, well probably not a good idea to look for an LOE um, in, in here it's uh, it's the, the depth constraint you, you can look for it you, you basically know enough to say if it's not very near the surface probably out cropping it's probably not worth going after so. What I see is, is important is to develop a, a, a toolkit for uh, for deep and covered exploration, and and that really is the 
is the modern or the, the deep and covered equivalent of the toolkit that's already available for um, exploration in exposed areas. And that involves a basement interpretation, a 3D model of geology and structure of the type that's been developed in DNQ, and uh, a 3D GIS of, of key geological, geophysical, and geochemical data sets. Um, and, uh, and value added, um, I guess, add ons to those, to, to those basic data sets in terms of an understanding, development of an understanding of the fairways to the features controlling mineralization and their interactions that might develop targets in those sorts of settings. And combine that with a clear understanding of the depth constraints for, for economic mining so that you're not chasing targets that could never possibly make it. And all of that. We're now in a, in a situation where, where it's possible to iteratively develop and refine those models and deliver them in an open format um, in, a, in a common earth model. And examples of those would be a leapfrog viewer or a geoscience analyst from, uh, from GOCAD, where those can be made available to be downloaded on the web. And, and, and any company um, carrying out exploration could then um, derive their own maps and sections in the areas they were working on um, and more importantly, and, and this is uh, you know something that, that probably the significance of it might be lost on some of you, but the, one of the things that happens when you're actually carrying out exploration in this sort of setting is that you you, you carry out a geophysical survey and you drill a hole, and what you have is a is a cross section that has one one hole or just a geological map, and you have no idea what the geology is there. But if you already have a, a hypothesis as to the geology probably going to be wrong, but you're going to have something to compare uh, when you do an inversion of your of your magnetotelluric data or your deep looking um, array style IP data, you're actually going to be using the known or at least interpreted geology in that area to constrain that inversion because one of the real challenges in the Mount Isa region and in, and, and in many other settings is, is the false alarm rate of geophysical data sets, where, where you look and you say, oh, there's a fantastic, you know, so in, in, in the Mount Isa region, for example, if you do, uh, um, if you do any sort of electromagnetic survey, um, that you will get a, a whole series of electromagnetic anomalies, conductive anomalies, that are related to graphite bearing metasediments as opposed to um, chalk pyrite or, or pyrotite in an actual ore body. And to be able to say, well, this, this anomaly is likely to be related to graphite, and this one is in a formation that shouldn't have any graphite in it, and therefore this is a better target, is an important thing to do. And, and to have these sorts of data sets in deep and covered exploration really um, would be a great leap forward. So, conclusions, um, deeper and covered exploration is a reality. As we keep trying to supply, supply metal demands, we're going to have to um, we're going to have to carry it out and find a way to, to do it better. And it's going to be much more reliant on the sort of exercise that I've just described and the traditional pre-competitive data that served us so well and allowed so many uh, discoveries is not going to be useful anymore and the sort of geological understanding is, is going to be coming more to the fore. And, this is, and the DMQ project is a, is a good example of that style of information. And so we're going to continue to focus on this process as well as I guess a broad range of research that focuses um, on on meeting some of the some of the efforts that are being carried out by some of the other uh, um, by some of the other programs within the uh, with, within the, uh, the PRC and the JKMRC. So um, that was all I wanted to say. Thank you very much for your attention.